So uh, I deny being an active organizer of this workshop, um, but two of the active organizers, John and Adam, approached me to give uh, this perspective talk. <coughs> and um, coming from a theoretical computer science uh, um, point of view, and as you see from the title, I'm not that sure that I'll be able to deliver that. It's not clear that this is a perspective, or maybe these are many perspectives, and it's not clear that you will call me a theoretical computer scientist after this talk. But let's see. So this is not going to be a tutorial, nor is it going to be a survey, and certainly not a historic survey. Uh, this is not my goal. Um, I'll tell you about my goals in a minute. So a few considerations in preparing this talk. One is that, as Adam mentioned, we invited quite a diverse audience for this uh, uh, program and for this workshop. And this is for a purpose. We believe that this is the right thing to do. And although this is a center for theoretical computer science, theoretical computer science, at least in some areas, needs to communicate with other very different areas of research, like law and ethics, of course, statistics, and so on. So um, one of my goals is to uh, give some uh, background and, and, and establish some vocabulary so that hopefully we share some ideas or you understand at least what we from the theoretical computer science community were trying to do some of the time and as a basis for our discussions. Another consideration is that there are certainly uh, questions that I'm bothered about, and I'll speak about a few of them uh, here. And maybe the third and most important consideration was that I know that Kunal is going to be giving a much better talk after I finish, so I can allow myself to do something quite an oddly shaped uh, perspective here. OK, so if there are questions, please do ask. So Kunal, you have, you have a big task, you see. Um, and the layout for this talk is going to have three uh, not equally sized parts. The first one is going to focus on differential privacy and how we get, how we got there and why. And here really my goal is to establish some joint vocabulary and begin discussion of paths forward, which I think are going to be very important for the, uh, for the uh, entire semester. Again, this may look that I'm serving some history and so on, but think about it really as uh, like a way to explain why we are doing some things the way we're doing them and as a seed for uh, our forward discussions. Then I'll uh, very briefly cover some thing that bothers me, and this is a question of bridging between legal and technical concepts of privacy. So this is one potential path forward. And then I'll have some concluding thoughts. And this is going to be quite a, um, a short part of the talk. And the goal is maybe this would be like a starting point for a working group throughout the semester. OK, so let's begin. So this entire semester is going to talk about, we're going to talk about data privacy or something I'll sometimes call informational privacy more broadly. And the, the problem is, is the following. We collect a lot of data, uh, not me personally, but there are organizations who do that. And this data can have very good users if we analyze it. So we want to uh, push that data into a process that I will call an analysis or computation or a mechanism. I'm going to use these terms interchangeably. And that thing, at least in the naive, in the simplest case, will output some outcome that is going to be useful, hopefully, for scientific findings or policy making and things like that. And our goal is given a data set with sensitive personal information, because this is often a collection of information about individuals how to compute and release functions of this information while protecting individual privacy. OK, so remember this slide. And before I uh, will go on with the, uh, with the talk, I want to play a small game. Let's try to test our intuition with respect to this uh, 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 problem. 
Um, now, I'm very bad at doing that, so if you don't guess it right, feel good about it, you can, it's okay. And I had about five or six uh, uh, challenges initially, which for the, uh, because of time limits, I, I will reduce to two now. Um, but let's suppose that, and the question is when is information privacy preserved? Okay, so suppose that something like this happens, there is data pushed into computation and an outcome is produced, and I'm worried, the reason I'm worried is because my record is in there, in the data set. Okay, so there is something about me with maybe sensitive information, maybe it tells whether I'm a theoretical computer scientist or not, which is, uh, it's quite an embarrassing trait, I think. And uh, let's assume that the outcome is indeed Kobe is TCS positive, okay? And now I'm looking at this and I'm asking, is my privacy breached? Okay, it looks like a, the simplest question to be asked here. Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? <laughs> who doesn't think? Who, who, who thinks we cannot tell? still see some people who did not make the demand, but maybe counterintuitively, if you haven't seen this before, that's the right answer, we cannot tell. And the reason is that, yeah, it could be that the computation actually takes the input and the input says, copy is a TCS positive and outputs that and copies that into the output. But we could also think about other computations that could have taken place here in particular the following one, so uh, the, the programming language I know is basic, as you see, and <laughs> so this is a very simple basic program. Uh, you output COBE is TCS positive, you ignore your data, and, and that's it, okay? And I would claim that maybe this is something that I would be disturbed about, or maybe there is like an issue for a defamation claim or something like that, but this program does not create any informational relationship between my information in the data set and the outcome. And hence, there's no way that information is leaked about me through this program, okay? So it's really important to look at the computation itself. And let's see just a second uh, uh, example. Let's say the same thing happens, except that the outcome is uh, that Adam is TCS positive and I'm not mentioned in the output, okay? Who thinks this is, this would breach my privacy? Who thinks it will not be breach my privacy? Somebody here? What's that? You will volunteer to think this way? <laughs> and who thinks we cannot tell? I see this is a very trained audience. Um, Yes, and again, the reason is similar because if this is the simple basic program that is uh, 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 implemented here, it tests what I'm TCS positive. If yes, it outputs Adam it is uh, TCS positive. Otherwise, it outputs John is. You see, it does not actually look at Adam's information. He, his privacy is not necessarily uh, uh, is, is intact here but mine could be uh, uh, influenced, okay? So again, we cannot tell. And the lesson I want to take from this is that it's very important to look at the computation and not to be tempted just to look at what the outcome tells us, okay? Which is unfortunately what happened probably in a lot of the privacy uh, literature for quite a few uh, decades. So, I want to uh, speak about uh, defining privacy, and let me begin with an example that uh, uh, is predates, I think, the work, most of the work, or all of the work in theoretical computer science on privacy. This is an example from Latanya Sweeney from 2000, where she, I, I'm sure you've seen this slide, so I will go very fast through them. But she took an anonymized data set with patient uh, information from Massachusetts, okay? And this is, this is part of a record from uh, that data set. So it has all these maybe interesting uh, features on the left and then also 
a zip code, birth date, and sex of that individual. Sorry. And then she combined that with another data set, the voter registration from Cambridge, which is public records. Anybody can expect them. And interestingly, these records also, uh, they, they are totally identified. So we have the name and address here. Uh, and they also have the zip, birth date, and sex. And she joined these two data sets. Okay? And when this join creates a unique uh, uh, combination, she could uh, deduce the identity of that person who was supposedly uh, anonymized. Okay? And in particular, she re identified these guys in records and she put it in, in an envelope and sent it to, to his address. Uh, and furthermore, Sweeney and in, in work with Samarati, they suggested a privacy concept, a new privacy concept, which is called anonymity. Anonymity is designed specifically to foil that linkage attack. Okay. And it is achieved via suppression of uh, information in the data set in order to make every combination uh, of potentially identifiable, uh, identifying attributes appear at least k times. So the problem, they thought, was that uh, these combinations, many of these combinations were unique. And then you had a clear re-identification of, of, of a record, maybe if we'll make sure that the, these combinations, these linkages are not unique, we'll gain privacy. And here's an example of how this is done. On the left you have an, a, like the original data set, of course it's a fake data set, and the two anonymized data set is on the right, and you can check that after the suppression of information indeed, uh, the, the identifying information, the left part uh, uh, of, of the table, uh, each row appears uh, at least twice. Okay? And you would think uh, this is a nice idea, very intuitive, and has been made to a lot of use. Like one example is a team at Harvard uh, used k anonymity, I think with k equals something between 6 and 10. Uh, to um, anonymize edX data uh, in uh, uh, 2015. Okay. Uh, smart people do this also. And we'll get back to this uh, later on. So this was one attack, and it led uh, to a new privacy concept. And I want to, for a minute, focus on this term, a privacy concept. Uh, we should be careful in using it, I want to say, and we should clarify to ourselves what we mean by privacy concept, when we say a privacy concept. And I'll get back to this again and again in the talk. Okay. So is this a good privacy concept? Is this a privacy concept? These are questions that I'm interested in. Let me mention another attack. This is worked by Yuri Tinur and myself, uh, and um, it began work in what is called now reconstruction attacks, also called blatant uh, non-privacy, and consider a system where sensitive information, like what we have here on the left, uh, about uh, n people is stored. Okay, for instance, for each person, you store whether they are. Uh, TCS positive or not, and then the system answers uh, statistical queries. Okay, and this is really nice because if you have such a system, then um, uh, researchers can ask queries and get answers for these queries, and hopefully do something about uh, this disease of people being TCS uh, positive. And that would be a positive uh, outcome for, for, for this. Uh, maybe, maybe there is a cure. Um, let's also assume that we have a guaranteed accuracy. And the accuracy is uh, better than root n. So if the, um, uh, the researcher specifies a, a subset of the population, that's for a statistical query, and asks how many people in this subset of the population are TCS positive, 
then the answer is not necessarily, the, the, the given answer is not necessarily accurate. It is within uh, something like root n from the true answer, okay? And we're not specifying how this noise is added. Maybe it's biased, maybe it's not biased. I have no clue, okay? The only thing we know is that the noise is bounded by, by root n. So now let's replace this good researcher guy with somebody else. Let's replace it with an attacker, okay? Is the attacker, the attacker now use this in order to do something bad? Okay. Um, now, maybe you'd think intuitively we're only asking, you know, aggregate cores here and noise is Moderate, okay, uh, it's not, not trivial. Maybe it's impossible for the attacker to do something, but, but actually there exists an attacker algorithm that usual, utilizes these queries. Doesn't need to make too many queries. Something that is linear in the size of the database and actually, um, and then perform a feasible computation, meaning that this is not like factoring numbers or, or solving crypto problems. This is something that can be done in reasonable time, and then reconstruct the data set, maybe not with 100% accuracy, but let's say 99% accuracy. So the attacker produces this data set data prime, which is very, very similar to origin, the original one, okay? And actually, the attacker can be successful with like a more uh, um, sophisticated, algorithm, even if many of the queries are answered arbitrarily. Uh, this is a work by uh, work McShane and Talwar. And then there are many other works follow that followed up producing similar results in, in, in various settings. An attacker that gets access to a specific functionality, maybe even with some noise or, or like with, with inaccuracy, can use that access in order to reconstruct the database almost perfectly, okay? So, from years, these have been uh, theoretical uh, results, and, and I think many uh, practitioners looked at them and said, oh, this is only theory, it doesn't have anything to say about real life. Um, but actually, attacks do work in practice, and in the last year, Aloni Cohen and myself, we, uh, <laughs> responded to a challenge that was put by, by, by a company, uh, by Aircloak, um, and used this kind of attacks in order to uh, show uh, a weakness uh, in, 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 in the system that they, um, uh, that they uh, presented, that we could actually reconstruct the data very accurately. But I think much more importantly is work that the US Census has been doing in the last year and, and that has uh, uh, reported on uh, recently that they can take the 2010 decennial census tables that are, were published in the, in the previous uh, decennial census and use these tables and this is like a lot of information, like quite a few numbers published for every individual who participated in the decennial census in order to reconstruct the data quite accurately. Okay. And not only the U.S. Census could do that, actually a reporter, Hansen, uh, reported in the New York Times that they probably did something similar in, in terms of technique to what the U.S. Census were doing, and they reconstructed the information for, I believe, for Manhattan. Okay. So these are things that not only very professional people can do, or like also people outside the census could access their information and, and, and reconstruct it. And what's interesting is that these very strong attacks now uh, become um, a tool for rethinking privacy and, and privacy policy because if, if it is feasible to reconstruct the data, then either privacy is completely lost or you are quite close to, to that happening. And that was not the only, these are not the only two examples of how, yeah, a question there. Can I ask a question? 
question. Okay. Um, there was a question in the back. Chief, you can ask first. Yes, please. Is it okay? Can I ask first? Yeah, please do. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were too quiet so far, so yeah. I'm happy to start things off. Good. Um, so, do you mind, or maybe we're going to talk about this later, do you mind being more specific about when you say the database is reconstructed? What do you actually mean by that? So, if you, I mean, maybe for some of us who are not, you're either computer scientists, statisticians, and other applied people, maybe you can use the census example and tell me what did they reconstruct from the yeah. 2010 uh, census data? Good. So, um, I will need to recall that. Um, so the original reconstruction attacks just say like the data is is a, is is a vector of bits for each person whether his DCA is positive or not. The R prime is also a sequence of n bits, and when you compare these sequences, they agree on 99% of the cases. Okay, and no matter what the original data was, how it's created, whether it comes from uh, an underlying uh, distribution or is it arbitrarily chosen, this reconstruction guarantee will hold. So that's, that's the meaning for uh, in the original uh, in, in like the sequence of papers that to do reconstruction, this is how this is, uh, should be interpreted. In, in these actual attacks, um, this, are this was an implementation of a similar uh, situation. Uh, again, the data we consider it as a sequence of bits, and I don't remember exactly the numbers. Uh, there is a report. Uh, we have a report, but I think like we managed to reconstruct with accuracy 96% or, or something like that. Um, the census data, they use different techniques from, from uh, our techniques for reconstruction. And um, essentially what you want to find is a data set that agrees with the publications that, are, that were made public. Okay, so if you take that data set, you could generate these publications from it. If that data set is unique, then you will uniquely recover the data. Okay, if there are some potential underlying data sets that all give the same uh, uh, tabulations, then it may be that you haven't uniquely recovered the data, but still you're likely to recover the information of a lot of individuals. Now, if I remember correctly, uh, for the 2010, for, for this work by the census, but we will need to check it afterwards, I think for about half the US population, they got um, the exact values that were uh, put in the tables. And then for a large majority of the, of the rest, and then the, 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 the main errors were with respect to, uh, only almost with respect to age, and these were within a few years span from the, from the right age. And even those were in many cases um, explained by the procedure that uh, in, in some places in the U.S., they first round ages to multiple of five, and only then they use it in a population. And then this loss of accuracy can explain like the two or three year difference. Yeah, so they reconstructed the demographic information in the census file. Exactly, yeah. They did not identify that information, which is another step that needs to be taken maybe to convince, I mean, I am convinced that this is a privacy problem, but uh, maybe others will need to actually see the identification. Personally, I believe that once you have reconstructed at this level of accuracy, then re-identification should be a feasible step. But we still need to see if this would happen. Yeah, so I had a similar question. Like, could you give us a, a brief intuition of, of you know, in the previous thing where you said you could reconstruct the data prime? Um, Maybe a one-line summary of... <laughs> so maybe one-line summary is what I already said. What you're looking, you, you, you need an algorithm that will find a data, a data set that is consistent with all the evidence that you see, that you see with all the publications. Okay, I don't want to get into the details of the particular algorithm. Helen? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm interested in the other side, which yeah. is here's a way to attack. I just hack the database and then I can get everything. 
So one of, it may be just a presumption in, in your talk with the audience that there's certain constraints on the, oops, sorry about that, on, on the type of attack yeah. that's allowable in order to do the test. Good point, good point. So I, I definitely, there are attacks where somebody infiltrates the census or my computer and, and gets direct access to the data. I'm not going to talk about these attacks. I'm going to think about a world where security researchers know what they're doing. And uh, hence, the only way to attack these data sets is via the legitimate um, uh, interface. So what the, the, the thing, and again, it could be and I'm not expecting, but then a lot depends on what that's legitimate. Interface. Exactly. So uh, here I define an interface where the attacker can make statistical queries and get answers to the statistical queries. In the census case, the interface is all the list of the, 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 the large amount of tables that they've published in the 2010 uh, decennial census. I'm not assuming that the attacker can actually infiltrate the census computers and get the data from there. Okay. Let me continue. So this, uh, is, these two attacks are not unique. Like in the last 20 years, we've seen a lot of failures of traditional privacy enhancing techniques. And, and this is a partial list and that you can probably uh, read. You cannot probably read. Um, and you could think that we lost privacy. Uh, but maybe we can get privacy to uh, uh, rise from the ashes. And let me. Stay, say a few reasons for optimism. This, so far, it looks like quite a bleak picture, or like if we've seen it in 2003, 2002, that is a bleak picture. Um, so I think one reason for optimism and one explanation why this work, a lot of this work came from people who had background in cryptography, the initial work, is that when we look at what happened in cryptography, there has been a revolution in the, in the late 70s, okay? And cryptography turned from something like an art to a science, an extra rigorous science, where we have security definitions, and we have rigorous analysis, and we have proofs of security, okay? Things that we did not have before. And this has transformed cryptography in the way that Cryptography is rarely the cause of a security flaw, if at all, okay? If at all. So getting back to your question, yeah, we, even though we have cryptography, we still have security flaws, but then the problem is not with the cryptographic interface or cryptographic uh, protocols usually, but with other aspects of the, of the system. And more importantly, maybe, this research has yielded tons of relevant influential concepts. I will just mention two of them uh, for this talk. One is the notion of semantic security. How do you define the security of a, an encryption scheme? Okay? This has been a powerful paradigm that has been explored for, I don't know, 30 or 40 years by, by cryptographers. And by the time we got to it, it was quite mature. And, and ripe to, to, to be grabbed and, and to continue with this. And the second thing that was uh, the cryptographers have looked at is this notion of composition. What happens if you design a secure system that is secure if it's the only thing that is executing in the world? If you have two of these systems running in parallel, do you still have security? If you have your system that is secure in a standalone manner, is it still secure when it runs in the context of other systems? Okay, and this tends to be an extremely complicated and intricate uh, question, but again, it set the ground for our thinking. When we started thinking about privacy, it was clear that it's not enough to, to build privacy systems that are secure or that are private in a standalone manner. You need to think about composition, okay? So by 2003 or two, the research was in privacy was at large ad hoc, and, and it lacked rigor. And coming again from a theoretical point of view, this rigor and in retrospect was in many, in many ways, it, the, it lacked rigor in setting clear, meaningful privacy goals. So privacy was not defined. 
it lacked rigor in analyzing the resilience not only to existing attacks, but to future attacks, something that you may think is impossible to do, but cryptographers have managed to do it in cryptography is the reason we won't be able to do it in privacy. It lacked rigor in taking our, uh, auxiliary knowledge into account, in accounting for privacy loss across multiple releases, in understanding how the techniques, the ideas that were uh, uh, presented communicate with normative and, uh, and legal and ethical conceptions of privacy. Okay? And these are things that we need to take, to take care of. So can we apply the crypto rigor to data privacy? And this is interesting, like maybe learning from crypto again, uh, there is a power in negative thinking, okay, that has played a crucial role in, in the privacy uh, work, I think in the last 15 years. And in particular, beginning with the reconstruction attack, you can think about them not only as a bad thing, but as a useful tool, because reconstruction attacks help you delineate or map the boundaries to what cannot be computed while respecting any reasonable notion of privacy. So even before you define privacy, you learn, you can learn a lot about privacy from reconstruction attacks. Maybe pictorially, you can think about it this way. If this is the map of the land of analysis or something like that, there is an area that is blocked to us because if you want that utility, then we can devise reconstruction attacks, okay? And what says that privacy land is somewhere here. I don't know yet exactly where. Maybe this is the boundary, maybe this is the boundary, okay? And what's interesting here, is that maybe there are points where they can actually, uh, the, 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 the transformation from reconstruction to privacy is like a phase shift. Uh, and so we are, with privacy, getting the most that is possible. Uh, clearly it cannot be this, okay? Because uh, if we want that utility in this area, this allows reconstruction. <coughs> And indeed, a new line of privacy work began. Um, in initial works with Irriti Noor and Stinted Work, there was a privacy definition and a Gaussian mechanism, what we now call the Gaussian mechanism. The semantics of the definition weren't very well understood then. It felt kind of right, but. Uh, and composition wasn't well understood. There was work from the database community uh, on the local model, uh, some more work later on on uh, how to do private statistics and machine learning, and the beginning of an understanding of this definition via a notion that is called informed adversary that luckily we don't have to use anymore. And um, later on, uh, this led, so here I'm going very fast uh, about this, probably like what is that, four or five years of thinking about definitions it led to differential privacy in 2006. And this came also with a beautiful paper by, a uh, work by uh, Cynthia Walker Moninor, where they made a case for differential privacy, explaining or, or why this approach is very plausible, why this approach is, is, makes sense. So let me tell you about differential privacy a little. Probably most of you uh, have heard this, so I'll try to go very uh, fast. Uh, yes, Adam, you can just do something else now because you know what differential privacy is. Uh, <laughs> and uh, differential privacy is not a particular technique or pa a particular mechanism. This is like if, if you think about differential privacy as a tool, you're thinking about it in the wrong way, okay? Um, it's not a particular technique, it's not a particular mechanism, it's a definition or if you wish a standard of privacy, okay? And this is a standard, or more precisely, it's a family of definitions, but I will treat them because they are quite similar, I'll treat them as one definition here. It expresses a very specific desiderata of an analysis. So the focus is on the computation, not the outcome, okay? As we, we've seen in the first couple of examples, this is, this is important and this is the, this is the right. We require that any information related risk to a person should not change significantly as a result of that person's information being included or not included in an analysis. Okay? 
And this is a mouthful. Let me now try to explain it with a picture. So consider two worlds. In the real world, we have, and by the way, this is also a paradigm that is borrowed from uh, cryptography. In the real world, uh, data is fed into an analysis and uh, an outcome is produced. Yes, this could be interactive, but I'm going to uh, 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 just for simplicity look at this picture. And again, you remember my data, my record is in that data set, so I'm worried that too much information would be about me could be leaked through the analysis into the outcome. Okay, this is my worry. I'm thinking about an ideal world, or if you wish, a counterfactual. This does not happen in reality, but I am thinking about a world where the same happens, just the data which is fed to the analysis does not include my information, okay? <coughs> and now, in the ideal world, I feel secure. There's no way that the analysis will take my non-existing data in the data set and, 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 and and produce something that is related to it in the outcome, okay? Now, if in the real world and the ideal world the output would be the same in, in, or indistinguishable, then I would feel that since my privacy is preserved in the ideal world, it's also preserved in my real world, okay? So this thinking with the counterfactual is going to be very useful for us. So that's intuitively what I'd like uh, to happen. Okay, but if you analyze this closely and you require that the outcomes are indistinguishable, then this means that the analysis must ignore my data, my record in the data set, okay? And uh, maybe that's not that bad because ignoring one record in the data set often does not change the utility in a very significant uh, way. But then Adam comes and he's also worried about his privacy and his record is in the data set and with the same kind of analysis, the, um, the argument, the analysis needs also to ignore his record in the data set, and Katrina also wants privacy. We need to ignore her data. And then, actually, we want to provide privacy for everybody in the data set, uh, even John. So we have to completely ignore the data set. Um, and that's bad for utility. Um, th this hasn't been that successful. But maybe, maybe we can uh, backtrack a little and instead of having this very strict requirement that the outcomes are indistinguishable or the same, let's allow some slackness there, like the outcome are similar. And we need to be careful in, change, in choosing this notion of similarity. Um, and, but when we do that, it turns out we don't have to throw away the data and we get differential privacy. This notion of similarity is chosen so that the chance of every event is almost the same in my ideal and real world. And, and I'll give a few examples in a few minutes. Epsilon is a number, okay? And the smaller epsilon is, the better privacy you get, but then you are also losing in utility. If epsilon is zero, we're back to to the uh, situation where we require perfect indistinguishability between the outcomes and hence no utility at all. So I'm sure Kunal will speak more about the definition. Uh, I'm not going to parse this. I just want to uh, say we can write it in, in math and the focus is on the mechanism, on the computation, on the analysis. It's not on, on the output, unlike anonymity and other, and other approaches. <coughs> So this gives us new privacy concepts. Uh, so this is the land of differential privacy. Actually, it's a confederate. There are many uh, um, small uh, differential privacies, uh, uh, variants of the definition, but uh, again. And as you see in the picture, in some places we know that it actually uh, gets, we're getting the most that we can from uh, different, from, in, in terms of utility because we, it touches their construction land. In other areas, we don't yet know. Okay. And maybe there is an, another concept that lies there and makes sense and we haven't discovered it yet. Or another attack. Or another attack, yeah. That's also a concept. Okay, and uh, uh, again, the, I'm saying these are new privacy concepts. I want to be careful in using 
the term privacy concept. And, and you may say, okay, people have tried it before. Uh, how do you know that this is a good privacy definition? <laughs> this probably was not. <laughs> And let me try to, to refer to this. So what makes a good privacy concept? And, and I will go through a few properties that I think are important. First, I said it several times, so it's okay to say one more time, it's a property of the computation and not the outcome, okay? So we're shifting from the intuitive view that we should look at the outcome of, of the analysis, like let's look at the anonymized data sets or, or, or can only in my assistant and something like that, to looking at the computation itself, okay? Because the computation is the entity that can create this informational relationship between the sensitive input and the outcome, okay? And this relationship is not understood if you look solely at the outcome, okay? So that's really important. Second property, this is, should be a privacy concept. So I think a privacy concept should allow us to make statements on informational harms, okay? Otherwise, maybe it's a concept, but not directly related to privacy, okay? Um, and let me give you a flavor of these such statements, and this will also refer to what I said, like the, the, the probability of every event in differential privacy should remain the same whether I contribute my data or not. Okay, in differential privacy, if the analysis is differentially private, then the probability that I will be, now put whatever you want to put there, I'll be arrested or I'll be denied insurance or I'll be shamed socially, the probability that this will happen will be almost the same whether my information is used in the analysis or it's not. So this is, I, this is what I call a, a guarantee that is related to, to privacy. So there is, a, uh, this is something that depends on the information uh, and the information that I, I have or contributed to the data. And this could be a, 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 a result of somebody looking at the data and other stuff in ways that I don't understand, uh, sorry, in ways that I don't understand, but still differential privacy gives me a guarantee that a harmful event will not change its probability significantly. And I want to say, I, I'm saying half harmful event, it's not a differential privacy distinguishes between good and bad events. All events get the same treatment, but many times when we speak about privacy, we're worried about the harmful events, not about the good ones. Okay, the good ones should also not lose in probability too significantly. Yes, you had a question. So, um, I mean, the, the mechanism to do this, I presume, is going to be some form of statistical query, right? Uh, because you're going to have some way in which you generate one statistical result depending on, and, and you know, the, the result is going to be slightly different depending on where it, the result should be different whether you're there or not. So how is this different from the previous one where you talked about where people could just run statistical queries against the data, um, but that turned out to not be different. So, yeah, so definitely when you can reconstruct the data, this is a very strong signal that this is not differential, that you cannot do something with differential privacy. Uh, the mechanisms for uh, differential privacy are mechanisms of noise addition, but you need to add the noise in, in a very careful way. This is one thing, and an interactive mechanism often will have to stop at some point and say we're not answering any more queries, otherwise the privacy guarantees are going to be uh, breached. Okay. Now, if we look at concepts that simply limit the format of the output, we don't have that, <laughs> these kind of guarantees. And in particular, this generates like kind of a penetrate and patch cycle. For instance, like in the traditional techniques, we started with the identification, improved it to anonymity, and then people found the weaknesses there and improved it to L diversity, T closeness, and I'm sure this is not the end of the list. Okay, we have some more. Uh, letters in the alphabet. Okay, a third uh, property that I also alluded to is composition. Okay, consider two or more independent mechanisms. 
okay? Maybe each of them satisfies the privacy concept requirements, but when you put them together, then, and, and consider the case where they process information about the same or related population, is privacy still preserved when you put them together, when you consider them together? With differential privacy, we have theorems, quite strong theorems showing that the combination of differentially private computations result also in differential privacy. The parameters change, so if we begin with epsilon, then we'll end up with a larger epsilon, but this in a sense is essential because any computation that makes useful makes use of the data, leaks some information, so th these uh, uh, leakages are accumulated. Quick question to this one. So this is a combina combination of computations or a combination of data? These are combinations of computations on maybe related data sets. Yes. Okay, relate, so we're still having so two data sets that are different. And maybe they both contain records uh, about me. Okay. And again, comparing with uh, our k-anonymity, it's conceivable that the composition of k, two k-anonymized data sets, which result in many individuals being one anonymized. Actually, we, it's very easy to come up with examples where this happens, but they are not very natural, maybe. But you, it's conceivable that the edX data that was published by the Harvard team, actually, uh, if you compose that with itself, then uh, privacy would be breached, okay? Under some notion of conceivable. Um, a fourth uh, property is, would like the notion to, to be quantifiable. We, if we are losing privacy every time we, uh, we produce something interesting with our data, we want to be able to quantify that, quantify the accumulation and so on, okay? And, and the important, thing to remember is data cannot be used indefinitely. When new insights are learned from the data set, then leakage also occurs, okay? And hence the privacy risks grow. And we need to be able to, we need some calculus to, to, to uh, uh, analyze the, the resulting privacy, okay? So, and we need to budget privacy laws, and we need to quantify the use of privacy. And if you ignore to do that, you might as well you know, remove the fuel gauge from your motorcycle and run indefinitely without having to refuel it. Okay, it makes the same sense. With differential privacy, the parameter epsilon measures leakage can be uh, uh, related to privacy harms and so on and can be treated as like a privacy budget, uh, which is consumed as analysis are performed. Okay, and we have theorems that help them ma manage this budget by providing bound on the overall use of the privacy budget. Uh, I want to say that we are not there yet in terms of understanding how to use these tools in real life, how to manage, how to set up the privacy budget, how to manage it, and there are many interesting social questions with respect to this because once you understand that privacy is a resource that is uh, a consumable resource, okay? And if you consume too much of it, then you lose it, then you have to think of how you allocate that resource among tasks and users and so on, questions that we uh, don't yet understand. And may the, the fifth, uh, fifth uh, principle I want to uh, mention here with respect to a good privacy concept is transparency. It's much better if it's not necessary to maintain the algorithm or parameters uh, secret when you use a, a, a privacy concept and the benefits of transparency. And again, this is a lesson that we learned from cryptography. Years in cryptography, cryptanalysis, uh, the scientific community can scrutinize, uh, scru can have a good scrutiny of, 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 the, of, of uh, mechanisms. Um, and furthermore, analyzers, statisticians can use, take that knowledge, they under, can understand how noise is added into the uh, computation and take that into consideration. So we will also get better utility. And with differential privacy, you can allow full transparency. You can actually reveal your mechanism and the parameters, everything except for the randomness. And in contrast, there are 
some traditional techniques, for instance, the uh, swapping, that is a technique that is used by the US Census. And here, security, if at all exists there, then it relies on uh, secret algorithms or secret parameters. That's a point where I can skip things because of time. Let me go very quickly on how differential privacy is achieved because there was also a question here. Uh, we add noise, as, as we do here. Um, differentially private computations introduce random noise in the computation. The simplest ways to do that is to add the noise, the noise on the input level or the output level. More sophisticated tools have emerged in the, like, since the introduction of differential privacy where noise is added in, in very crucial points during the computation. Many times this gives us much better utility. Just, I, I will not get into the technical details. I, I'm sure we'll hear a lot of these examples in, in the more technical talks. Let me just give like in pictures, like uh, this is a fabricated data set uh, and which we reconstructed. So this is uh, the cumulative uh, distribution function of, of the distribution and we estimated it with differential privacy with various uh, values of epsilon. You see if epsilon is very small, we're getting a noisy version of, of, of the curve. And then this is a larger epsilon you see it's, it's a better approximation. This is uh, even a better epsilon, a larger epsilon, not better in terms of privacy, and so on. And by now we have tons of things that can be computed with differential privacy, including descriptive statistics and supervised and unsupervised machine learning tasks, some of which you will hear, hear about in Kunal's talk, and generalization, uh, generation of synthetic data and many other applications. One thing to, to remember is because of noise addition, differentially private algorithms work best when the data sets are large. And so uh, if you have a small data set, then it's likely that uh, the application of differ that differentially private computations are not going to give you good utility with that data set. What's not, what does differential privacy give us? Um, it would be a mistake to think that if computation is done with differential privacy and my data is there, then my, that my information is kept secret, okay? Actually stigmatizing information, information that can help manipulate me, things like that could be learned about me with differential privacy, okay? But this would be the case when they could be learned even if my information was not included in the data set. Okay, so uh, there are certainly things like that. There's a question to be discussed whether this is a problem, whether this is a privacy problem, and I'm not going to answer this. People answer this question in, in different ways. Um, and, and another uh, thing to remember is differential privacy is not applicable in uh, settings where somebody needs to actually uh, operate on your specific information. For instance, when an ad is tailored to you or a news article, things like that. We don't have good privacy uh, notions for these settings and it would be interesting to um, see if, if we can develop them. So maybe this is, could also be part of discussions in this, in this workshop. 17.930 correctly? Good. And I think thanks to the theoretical treatment of foundations of privacy and differential privacy, we see that uh, this helps us build relationship with many areas of research. This is one benefit, I think, great benefit of the theoretical computer science approach. And, and some of these areas are here, cryptography, databases, complexity theory, learning, online algorithms, preventing full discovery, mechanism design, priming languages, policy and regulation, implementing differential privacy, notions like fairness. 
Interestingly, some of these are to non, uh, where, where some of these are places where differential privacy, this concept is used for non-privacy reasons, and in particular in these three areas, like using it in construction of online algorithms, in preventing false discovery, in mechanism design, and we'll hear about some of these uh, in, 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 during the week. There are some existing applications, like this is an old one by the, by now it's old, by the Census Bureau, uh, the, uh, the on the map uh, application. Google had implemented uh, uh, in a differential, differentially private computations in the system for uh, telemetry. Uh, it's called Rapport. Uh, Apple is using differentially private computations since iOS 10. And there are also some academic uh, projects, like this one is the Privacy Tools Project at Harvard. Some challenges. It's a new concept, uh, and one question is how to communicate its strengths and limitations beyond the computer science com community. Okay, How do we develop that language that allows others to operate on on these ideas, and what are the right use cases for implementing uh, differentially private computations at this stage? There's the challenge that I mentioned about setting the privacy budget, and there's an important policy question here with respect to how do you choose the privacy budget, that parameter epsilon, and how do you allocate it among tasks? Uh, and there's the question of matching RITs with privacy law and regulations. Okay, so here um, I'm, I, I, I ended the first part of the talk, uh, which it's a good time to get a perspective on the perspective, I guess. <laughs> and uh, what's nice about the perspective of it lets you sit back, relax, reflect on the log path that you've taken since you started this work and how far you got from the starting point, okay? Something like in this picture. Uh, and oh, you may uh, be returned to uh, maybe we're back in the initial uh, point that we were at, and hence uh, you may remember this uh, slide. Um, uh, I'm showing it again, and to remind us that the, what we're talking about is this problem of giving a data set with sensitive personal information, how to compute and release functions of the data set while protecting individual privacy, okay? <laughs> and kind of we gave one answer to this question, what does this actually mean, okay? Protecting individual privacy. But I want to get back to this question and, and try, uh, maybe try again. So, here, think about in this, hopefully this will happen a lot, a computer scientist, legal scholar will meet at the Simons Institute and they will uh, talk about privacy and then probably we'll get to some issues. For instance, they would use the same words but the meanings are going to be incompatible. Okay, uh, what is it that you mean when you say privacy or linkage or things like that? They would use different reasonings um, and they will pursue different values and goals, okay? And the question is whether we can do some work in order to bridge these different views uh, of, of privacy. So what does uh, protecting individual privacy mean? And we've seen, I, I talked a lot about the TCS approach, okay? It's rooted in complexity theory and cryptography. It advocates generality and mathematical rigor, and it generated many interesting uh, concepts like reconstruction attacks, differential privacy, composition that I mentioned, privacy budget, and, and some other things that we, I did not have time to, uh, to, uh, to mention. Um, these are concepts that were born during this uh, technical analysis of privacy. But if we look at uh, other areas like the law, then different answers are going to be given to, to this question of what does protecting individual privacy mean, okay? In the legal approach, 
I have to say I'm not well versed in the legal approach, so I may be somewhat misrepresenting it here. This is my view of the legal approach. Uh, privacy, this, the answer to this question is specified in regulations, and these answers are given with varying levels of specificity and accuracy. Okay. And some examples of the regulations in the U.S. is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, uh, which deals with the educational records, HIPAA, health insurance port portability and uh, accountability, uh, which has in it a privacy standard with respect to health records, Title 13, which is the law that uh, refers to the work of the U.S. Census, and they have a very short paragraph about the, pri the, the census obligation to keep information that is collected confidential. Uh, in the U EU, we all heard about the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation that has come into effect in the last year. Uh, and maybe one difference between the EU and the U.S. Uh, attempts uh, are that uh, in, in, the, in the U.S. <coughs> I'm sorry, um, there, are, there, 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 is, there are quite a few regulations uh, that uh, talk about privacy and they are very spe sector specific. And when you look at some of them, you see that they don't really, uh, they, they sometimes uh, diverge on how to describe uh, the privacy, they, they diverge on the uh, approaches that they take on the level of, uh, 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 on the number of details that they give and so on. And in the EU, um, at least now, we see an attempt to generalize this in, into one uh, regulation. There are some inconsistencies and uncertainty, and these are uh, uh, documented and written up about in, 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 in uh, legal scholarship. And if we look at these, you see that there are also, uh, there's also a collection of recurring concepts, um, which are different from those that we uh, had in the theoretical computer science analysis. Uh, maybe the most prominent in the legal writing is this notion of personally identifiable information, or variants on, on this concept, but then also ideas like identification, anonymization, which, are, uh, which refer to specific families of tools or approaches to provide privacy. Um, notions like linkability, when people speak about uh, 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 assessing whether attacks like Sweeney's attack are possible. <coughs> Notion like singling out that I will speak about in a few minutes appears in the GDPR. Inference, um, informational risk, statistical purposes, uh, the idea of opting out, consent, and, and some more and some more concepts. Right and these are quite different languages, and you could ask whether we can bridge these very different languages. And um, in, in like a few questions that can be asked about this is whether these expectations that are expre expressed in the law are they reasonable and are they atten attainable, or maybe we can we should modify them a little to adjust them to our current scientific understanding of informational privacy. And on the other way, uh, you could look at this. This is, looks very far from something that a, a, a lawyer or an ethicist would write. And you could ask whether these technical concepts match the legal or normative understanding of privacy. Are we talking about something similar? Are we talking about the same thing? Okay. Or are we solving a different problem when we are uh, uh, coming with, with this approach? Okay. So um, I want uh, to speak briefly about some ideas here. This is part of a project that uh, we've been running, be beginning with a, with a group at Harvard, I think about five years ago. And um, initial work that we had uh, focused on this standard, on FERPA, and uh, tried to see if we can uh, make a claim that differential privacy, the use of differential privacy, when I say that 
I mean the use of differentially private techniques, whether that satisfies the legal requirements that in FERPA for protection of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, educational records. Um, and I'm, I'll be very happy to speak about that, but I chose not to spend too much time there and um, speak about uh, parts of a newer work where we um, look at the concept that is taken from the GDPR and try to see whether we can figure it out, uh, starting from the legal text and going into a more technical analysis of this concept. And I, again, I'm going to go over this quite briefly. I believe there's going to be, there will be a talk about this in one of the upcoming uh, workshops. So what is singling out? When you look at the GDPR, it's quite a monumental uh, document and it's uh, composed of articles and recitals. If I understand correctly, and I'm not sure I do, the articles are more operative and the recitals are more uh, helping understand some of the concepts, although I've seen that this is not always the case when you read the text. And the first article in the GDPR uh, tells us what this regulation is about. They say this regulation lays down rules re re relating to the pro uh, protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data. Okay? One way to read this, if what you have is data about natural person, if this is personal data, then there are all these rules in the GDPR that you now have to uh, be aware of and, and make sure that, you're, that you uh, follow, okay? Or another way, a way to accept yourself from the, the requirements of the GDPR is to stop working with personal data. Make sure that the, your data is not personal data. <coughs> now, in Article 4, uh, personal data is defined and they say, Personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. An identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly. Okay. Why is that funny? <laughs> it's a bit, it seems a bit circular, but, um, but it tells us that like when we're, what's important in personal data is the fact that it contains yeah, uh, information about natural persons and furthermore, that information could be identified. If the information cannot be identified, then we were fine in the sense that we can accept ourselves from, from the, the requirements of the GDPR, okay? And later on, in recital 26, I think this is fascinating text, by the way. Uh, it's really interesting to look at this this uh, uh, legal standard. In recital 26, they say, to determine whether a natural person is identifiable, account should be taken of all the means reasonably likely to be used, such as singling out to identify the natural person directly or indirectly. By the way, after singling out, they don't give another example. So that's the only uh, example of what it means, what it could mean, mean that a person is identified if that person is singled out, okay? Um, in the earlier uh, data protection directive, uh, singling out is mentioned along wise with, uh, um, uh, with linkage and inference. So they have a, a slightly longer list of things that uh, could go wrong. But in the GDPR, singling out is the only one that is explicitly mentioned. And you would hope to do a control F on the GDPR, search for singling out, and find the next recycle, recital that uh, uh, defines it. But unfortunately, the, this term appears only once, only once in the, in the standard. So what can you do now? Luckily, the 
Uh, they predicted the data protection directive. They set up a working party. It's called the Article 29 Working Party, that produced uh, a collection of documents that explain uh, various terms, various ideas uh, from from the data protection directive. Okay, and in particular, there is a, a document. It's the Article. 29 working party opinion on anonymization techniques. And it's an interesting document that reviews these concepts of singling out uh, linkability and inference. They try to explain them. And they also review a collection of uh, 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 technologies and try to assess which technology solves which, each, which issue. OK? And when they uh, speak about singling out, they say, as regard directly identified or identifiable persons, this category typically relates to the phenomenon of unique combinations, whether small or large in size. Okay. A name itself may not be a name itself is not may not be necessary in all cases to identify an individual. This may happen when other identifiers are used to single someone out. Okay, and um, as, and, and the red text is of, of course my highlight. Um, and this is a table that the, these guys provide. You see, uh, there is a collection of uh, um, what they call anonymization techniques, and for which they ask: Is it is singling out still a risk? Is linkability still a risk? It's inference still a risk, and you'll see that uh, whereas differential privacy is here, and they say yeah. to the question, is single out uh, still a risk? They say may not. Okay, figure that in your mind what that means. And um, for uh, anonymity and diversity, they say, oh, single out is not a risk anymore. Okay. So there is noise addition that's not differential privacy. Yeah. And apparently it's stronger than differential privacy. And it's somehow better, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, and we'll focus on this left hand side of the of the of, of the table. Okay. I mean you could ask a lot of interesting questions about this table. Yeah. And then um, we also used this uh, text from a paper by uh, Francis et al. where they uh, say we define signaling out as in occurring when an analyst correctly makes a statement of the form. There's exactly one user that has these attributes. And, and in the paper, they claim that they uh, negotiated with the French. I mean, that's my understanding of their claim in the paper that negotiated with the French uh, uh, Data Protection Authority and that they approved these, these uh, interpretations of the terms. Yeah. Well, I guess I was going to ask about that. So what, what uh, kind of legal weight does this article? What, what so this article carries no legal weight. I, and the importance is, I think, the text that I, I, I had before. And this just, for us, it was a, a, uh, an interesting starting point for thinking about this um, that seems to, to uh, it, it is, it was also our understanding of, of the text written in the Article uh, 29 document. And this is why I'm, you know, I'm giving them credit for, for, for this. Yeah. So actually, maybe a related question. Do, do, you, do we understand sort of the legal weight of things written by a working party, for example? Are they, do they I mean, it's probably much more complicated by that, and this, I shouldn't answer this. Uh, this is going to be part of uh, a, a an anal legal analysis that needs to be done to uh, um, to go with the technical analysis that I will speak about here. Uh, but this is certainly a good question. One thing is that we, uh, I think in Europe, I spoke with several lawyers, and I got very different answers with respect to the standing of this document, because it's a document that was written before the GDPR took, uh, 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 before, before the GDPR. So this, and some say that this document is 
still relevant in interpreting the concept from the GDPR and some say that it's not. So de there's definitely an interesting legal question there. Okay. But I will work as if we can work out of this text, yeah. Singling out really a problem on its own? I mean, somebody say something about why? That's a great question. So you could ask yourself, why did the Europeans care about singling out? Where, like in most of the US standards, they speak about identification, OK? And I think this is an interesting progress, because many of the attacks, the re-identification attacks, singling out was an important stepping stone towards re-identification. And I think it, it makes sense to say, even if there, if there is a way to single somebody out, this may lead in the future to re-identification. But again, I'm not privy to what they thought uh, you know, were the reasons for including this. But I think it's an interesting step beyond just saying re-identification. So in your work that you're pursuing on singling out, are you assuming that the word Identifying is non-problematic in the way thinking out is, is? I didn't say that. I think the word identifying is extremely uh, uh, problematic. Uh, we're working on singling out. One reason is that this was a place where we felt we could make some progress, whereas with some of the other concepts, we are still stuck with making first steps. Yeah. So it, it's just, it may be just a mere, matter of that, that this is, uh, 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 this is a concept that we feel we made some progress with respect to. That's, that's it. It doesn't mean that it's the most important one, even. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so um, <coughs> where was I? So let me uh, give an example for our interpretation. So in particular, just remember that you don't need a name to n don't necessarily need a name to single out. Like you just want to say, uh, here's a unique combination that singles out. Okay. Here uh, the, and now to 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 explain our interpretation, let's take this uh, fake Netflix price data uh, example. Okay. Um, here we have three users and the, the movies that they've seen, the dates, and so on. There is exactly one row in this underlying data set that contains the movie The Sting. Which one? The third one. There is exactly one row that of a person who watched Mulan between February 19th and March 10th. Okay? Um, and, and you see that we don't specify exact dates here, but this still singles out somebody in this table. And there's exactly one row that does not satisfy any of these two previous conditions. Okay, and in all these three uh, descriptions single out rows in, in, in this data set. Okay. So let's try to define what the regular meant when they said singling out. And I'll, I'll think about a data set X that is of size N that is drawn IID from some underlying distribution, okay? Um, ideally, I'd like to remove the IID distribution assumption, but we don't know how to yet. Maybe there is a way to do that. This data set is fed into an anonymization mechanism, and the anonymization mechanism publishes some data. Why? Okay, so maybe aggregate or table or something like that. And then the singling out adversary gets uh, a hold of this published data and tries to uh, single out the data set, okay? It could also be that the mechanism is interactive, but just for simplicity, I'm going to uh, forget about it just for, for this current presentation. The signaling out adversary then outputs a description of what we call in mathematical language a predicate. Okay, this is a condition on possible rows of the data set, like the three examples that I gave before. And then the adversary's goal is given this published data that is supposed to preserve privacy or, anim or anonymity to output a predicate that matches exactly one row in the underlying data set X, okay? And so the adversary wants to isolate a person in the data set, 
And here's a uh, first attempt in a definition. M, this anonymization mechanism, is secure against singling out if no adversary can isolate a row except for negligible probability. Negligible means uh, th there is a technical definition for that, but let's say it's very small, less than one in a million. Okay? Um, and this is a very intuitive definition, and actually we did have a meeting with people from uh, like uh, relevant people in Europe, and we were reading this definition. They were, they seemed to 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 like it, um, except there's only one problem, that this is impossible to do. Okay, um, and why is this impossible to do? Okay, because there exists a trivial adversary. The trivial adversary does not get to see anything about the data set. Okay, so we eliminated the mechanism, we eliminated the output. And the trivial adversary now tries to output a predicate that isolate a, a row in that data set. Okay? And interestingly, this is possible to do if the adversary can choose a predicate that matches about one over n uh, of the universe, I mean, like that is correct for a randomly chosen person with probability one over n, that a trivial calculation shows that this adversary who did not get any access to the data, succeeded with probability 35%. Okay, quite high probability. Just yeah. assuming that he knows a, a distribution. This was an invited question or not? <laughs> okay. Uh, and so this says that the adversary can always, I'll answer it in a minute, the adversary can always answer a single out without even seeing why, with very high probability 37%. Okay, and if the adversary get that, that's fine. If the adversary gets a feedback whether he succeeded or not, then this uh, probability will rise to 100% to very easily. Just repeat it un until the adversary succeeds. Okay, after three trials, on average, the adversary will succeed. Now, just to make this concrete, if the math is not familiar to you, like here's an example. If, if this database X contains 360, information about 365 people, okay? Uh, and let's say that these are random people taken from, then the predicate saying uh, date of birth is October 23rd matches one over 365 uh, uh, portion of the universe, okay? Just like a random uh, uh, birth date and hence, if the adversary outputs that, he uh, can isolate with probability 37%. So it's really trivial to do. Now to your question, Raif, actually in, in these examples, it looked as if I needed the adversary to know the underlying distribution, but using a tool from randomness extraction, in particular the um, leftover hash lemma, one can uh, create this predicate uh, without needing to know the underlying distribution, assuming that it has uh, sufficient mean entropy. It doesn't have to have much, some logarithmic in N. So it's, the answer is no. The adversary does not need to, to know almost anything about the un underlying distribution. And I'm jumping now over a few steps and simplifying, but here's an idea. Uh, after observing this impossibility and so bringing some technical wisdom into, into the thinking, we can try now to nudge this definition as little as possible because we don't want to, if we started with a legal text, we want to be as close to it as possible. But we can modify the definition by saying that the adversary ma manages to single out if the adversary matches, if it outputs a predicate that matches exactly one row in the data set, but also that this predicate has weight that is bounded away from one over n. Okay, so we're not running into this uh, triviality. And the benefit of having this uh, definition is that, such a definition is that now we have something a formal definition, we can actually do the comparison with canonymity or with differential privacy and prove theorems. And let me, I will not get over the details, but with canonymity, we can show quite a general result that for typical canon anonymizers, 
Okay, you can signal out non-trivially, so with the with, with with the predicate that has weight bounded away from one over n, with high probability, with this 37 percent probability. Um, and for differential privacy, we can prove that differential privacy protects against this notion of singling out, uh, and it establishes also interesting connections with. Uh, ideas like generalization of uh, generalization properties of differential privacy. So, one benefit is I feel we we understand signal out a little better now than than we did before. You could ask whether differential privacy this means that differential privacy provides anonymization under the GDPR, and I would be very careful and say this is unclear. It requires more research. Uh, singling out was only given as an example there, and. Preventing single out is necessary, but probably not sufficient. Okay, so certainly we need to do more work now. And going back to this table from the Article 29 Working Party uh, document, sorry, we now can say we disagree with this uh, maybe very intuitive uh, uh, determination that calamity satisfies this requirement for singling out. And actually, our analysis shows that anonymity gives an adversary, does most of the work for an adversary in order to single out, okay? The adversary only needs to do something trivial, combine what he gets from the K-anonymizer with a trivial predicate, and he manages to single out. Whereas, with respect to differential privacy, our notion, the notion that we present for single out which may not be as strong as, as needed, uh, is satisfied by differential privacy. I say may not be as strong as needed because we made, in particular, we made this assumption that data is IAD from some underlying distribution. Okay. Is this notion, I, I, I took a lot of uh, time uh, talking about when are privacy concepts a good concept? Is this a good concept? Okay, and I say partially, it is useful for examining disclosure limitation concepts like differential privacy and anonymity with respect to the legal requirements, I think. But then, and it's resilient to post-processing, um, but uh, we can prove that it doesn't self-compose. Okay, and as I mentioned, I think composition is a crucial, crucial uh, property for good privacy concept. So I got to slide 298, I guess. Uh, um, so this is not a summary. Uh, so we spoke about foundational rigorous approach to data privacy, and this had led to new concepts and rich theory and initial steps of real life deployment. We saw the positive side of negative thinking. I think I spoke about that in a lot, and I also spoke about the growing relationship between theoretical computer science and scholarship that maybe only 10 years ago we, we would think are you know, outside the, the reach of theoretical computer science, like legal and, and ethical uh, scholarship. And I think this is, a, a, I, I look at this as like a, a, a great sign of maturation for our field that we're doing that. We're, we're, uh, taking responsibility. And I have one more uh, slide, as you see. Um, and this is a completely different direction from uh, everything I've said so far, or, or maybe not. Uh, where are we heading uh, at? And, and again, here I think my, my main my main goal is to think about establishing a working group throughout the semester. Um, so, uh, personal information is collected and controlled by industry and government at a never before imaginable extent. Uh, I think we would agree with that. And differential privacy, I said, it may maybe the story that I told, you know, sounds like like a pink, nice story about how we conquered privacy, how it draws from the ashes, whatever. But is this a real improvement or is it a fig leaf for, for these organizations? And I don't have a good answer for that. 
Uh, in particular, you could ask whether differential privacy is currently used as a tool to keep the power in the hands of the data holders. Okay, because if you think even uh, if we think about the current implementations that use the local model and require a massive participation in order to get utility, then this seems to fit here. Okay, so. We can ask whether this imbalance between industry and individuals be mitigated, and Katrina is going to talk about some uh, thoughts that we've started assembling together. Uh, when are you talking? Thursday. On Thursday. Uh, and um, about the research agenda around a, a topic that we call data co-ops, and I think there is a lot of theory, there would be a lot of theory to think about and develop there. And maybe, a last question in this uh, not that um, positive direction is what if privacy is already completely lost? And I don't think it's a ridiculous question anymore. Can we uh, understand what functions privacy had and restore them using other tools? And I think this audience, because we have spent so much work in understanding, analyzing uh, privacy rigorously is best positioned to try to begin thinking about this and, and answering this question. If we lost privacy, can we get the functions that privacy gave us uh, using other tools? And I think here, with this positive tone, <laughs> I will I'll finish. Definitely a lot of more information to be generated. Uh, yeah, I, I think certainly for the information that was, that is being collected was is a bit misleading, okay? It's being con collected and used uh, like as we speak and certainly about the past, there's this question whether we, we lost control there and whether, and it could be that that information is already sufficient for for us to feel that you know the benefits that we got from privacy in the past the, the reasons that a notion like privacy exists that this is already broken and I, 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 I did not want to to uh, I have a few uh, ideas on like how how do we uh, think about privacy and like the, the benefits that privacy gave us, but let me, like one idea is to say that privacy is a tool for reducing complexity in everyday life. When you go to your doctor, you don't need to think or strategize about the information that you're giving. When you're in, in interpersonal relationship, you don't need to strategize about the information that you're giving or you need to like to make less complicated decisions with respect to it uh, compared with, with a case where you don't have privacy. So one question could be whether if we are losing this tool as, as, as a tool for reducing complexity and making decisions in everyday life, can we replace it with another tool that will help us do something similar, reduce the complexity of making these decisions? Yes, Adam. I have a question about uh, formalizing um, legal notions. Given that, uh, at least in uh, common law, legal notions exist both sort of in statutes and regulations as written, the, sort of the, the aspect you were talking about, but also kind of there's this sort of living and evolving notion of various concepts embodied in, um, you know, precedent yeah. and, and sort of practice the way it's actually used. And so I wonder if there's any um, hope, or what would what are the challenges beyond the sort of trivially obvious ones of formalizing these um, 
I'm not. I'm sure there's a, a term for it for these kind of uh, constantly evolving types of, of notions. So first, let me say that uh, is Alex here. Alex is here. So we, many questions about the legal work need to be addressed to Alex. But one thing that uh, definitely I observed as we work is that we wish we had that uh, precedence president, uh, and that we could use that as information in our legal analysis. As you see, the legal text is very thin in, uh, mostly, and interpretation coming from courts could be very useful to us. Unfortunately, as far as I know, this hasn't been litigated in with respect to the questions that we are interested in. And so I think, at first at least, this is going to be very interesting to see how courts think about these questions when they need to, when, when, when they're brought to them. Uh, I also hope that some of the reasoning that we suggest will be useful for the courts in, in, in thinking about this. Because we're bringing tools from mathematics that usually courts are not are not uh, using. But uh, yeah, I think that's going to be very interesting to see uh, how first to see courts deal with these tough questions, and then whether they what we're saying makes sense to the court, or in what ways we can translate the language that we're using to the language that that they that they can operate on. Um, and yeah, so I'm giving you a non-answer, I guess, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you mentioned that DP, uh, differential privacy, is not applicable where specific information needs to be acted upon. Now, I would argue that most of the information collected, especially at least by tech companies, is intended to be acted upon, you know, to be recommend, to recommend something or to serve an ad or something like that. Uh, do you see, do you think that DP is just a fundamentally incompatible paradigm with protecting privacy in, in that kind of setting? Or do you think, um, um, you know, there could be specific variants of it, it could be adjusted to that? Or um, what are your thoughts kind of on, on Yeah. So, I think it's, it's certainly, um, realistic to think about differential privacy giving answers to a portion of the privacy problem, okay? And that's this is why it was important for me to give that slide for us to realize that, yeah, we're not, we haven't solved the entire privacy problem. We managed to carve out a significant portion of it and deal with it very successfully, I, I believe. But it doesn't mean that we, uh, have theory for the entire privacy problem. Um, maybe in some cases, differential privacy would be applicable when when you operate on a, a person's data. But um, I think these will be quite special cases. So essentially, what differential privacy says is that you are going to get the same treatment whether I'm using your data or not. Okay, <laughs> and that seems contradictory to to that. So. Only in cases where uh, it's not contradictory to this statement, we could use differential privacy. Um, and I think we are missing uh, an understanding of what is a concept of privacy that is applicable in the case of like when, when we operate on individual uh, person's information. Okay, for instance, when you are shown an ad, when you click on an ad, things like that, it's not clear to me. People do speak about privacy but in this context, but very informally, it's not clear to me how to capture it in a way that we can, you know, that we can work with. I was What's just going to say maybe a slightly more positive take is it's important to think about what aspect of that acting on the data needs to be made public facing or needs to be made visible to the company. Mm -hmm. So if the company doesn't actually need functionally to see that I've clicked on the ad, maybe it's possible to give some guarantees. I mean, you know, yeah. obviously there's some, some work yeah. to be done in, <laughs> yeah. in making that a reality. But, but I think it's worth thinking hard about who actually needs access to what. Right. Yeah. And, and users and companies may have different views of who needs Necessary, access. Necessary, yes. <laughs> exactly. So, so if we're talking about 
questions like that, uh, you know, companies showing me ads without the company learning my information. There are definitely tools in cryptography that are suited for, for doing that. Uh, I think the privacy question comes to life and becomes more interesting when at the end of this chain, the individual is going to operate in the public, maybe based on, 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 on things that happen there. Are them in, so even if all this chain was invisible to the public, the fact that the outcome is <laughs> makes the entire, <laughs> make you, makes you, makes it important to ask what is happening throughout this chain and how that affects uh, privacy overall. You were mentioning the cryptographic tool, so when you put the fig leaf, I was wondering <laughs> there are a lot of meanings to what that, uh, I don't know exactly what you meant, but one of them is that you're giving data <coughs> willingly because you think that they're going to use French privacy. So these companies, you're sort of trusting them to handle the data. And there are cryptographic ways, maybe they're not efficient enough right now, but that's, let's say, in the details, mm -hmm. and you will become where you don't give the data ever in the clear and you only give specific usages. Is that what yeah. you're alluding to in your answer? So, in, in the answer here? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So I think that what, maybe, I don't know if this was an intention of this semester, but it would be interesting to see how to work with crypto and the French privacy together. I don't know if this was in your talk because I didn't come in the beginning. So it was in my talk and because of time it uh, did not uh, get to the final cut. Um, definitely, I think like uh, the question of how crypto and the French privacy interact is a fascinating one. We don't have enough work done in this direction. We have some work done in this direction. It seems like each community is developed by itself, and both and usually the definitions are extremely strict. And it could be that a combination of them could be more relaxed and yeah. deliver more. So has, there has been work definitely in the area of like commanding differential privacy and secure multi-party computation. Yeah. But more as tools that together would deliver something rather than actually. Uh, so what we're missing, I think, like like in the centralized model, for instance, differential privacy, does crypto help there? And uh, we have very little understanding of, of, of this question. Yeah. Right. Let's uh, take one more quick question and then we'll go to the break because uh, Gunal, uh, you're eating into your own time here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is more a public kind of question. I guess probably we'll go back to the last question. So there are settings like, say, when I click on a movie in, on Netflix, Netflix has to act on it and show me the movie that I want to watch. Yeah. There may be cryptographic solutions to how to make hide that information from Netflix, for example. Uh, but differential privacy is also applicable in making sure that that information is hidden from other users. So, which movies I watch mm -hmm. uh, should not be leaked to other people in how they interact with Netflix. And that's a place where differential privacy is definitely definitely applicable. Then there's what's uh, shown how to do it. So then definitely, this is a very good example. Like you, we could deliver the movie with differential privacy, but do billing with sorry with crypto, but do the billing with differential privacy, for instance. And that would be an interesting combination of the two. Okay, thank you.